If Artemis was silver, then her twin Apollo was all gold. If Artemis was the moon, then Apollo was the sun, with his radiant features captivating all who beheld them. His proportions and lineaments remain the very ideal of a certain kind of male beauty. A certain kind, meaning that Apollo was striking not only in his fair complexion, but in his beardless face and hairless chest, a rarity amongst Greeks and their gods. He was a smooth man, but no less manly for that. Apollo is lord of mathematics, reason, and logic, and his realm lies within poetry, medicine, knowledge, rhetoric, and enlightenment. In essence, he is the god of harmony. It is an Apollonian idea that the base material world and its ordinary objects have divine properties and can resonate with the heavens whether expressed in the magical properties of squares, circles, and spheres, or in the perfect modulation and rhythms of a voice, or a chain of reasoning. Even meaning and destiny can be read in ordinary things, if you have the gift. And Apollo has it in abundance, allied to an inability ever to lie which made him the natural choice for taking charge of oracles and prophecy too. The laurel is sacred to Apollo, his particular and familiar animals being the dolphin and the white raven. And of course, most sacred to Apollo is the python. Even the Romans worshipped Apollo under his Greek name and like the sun, Apollo is Apollo wherever you go in the world. If you remember your myths and stories correctly, you will remember the magnetite stone the pregnant Rhea had used to trip Kronos into swallowing instead of the infant Zeus. The same stone Kronos would later vomit up, which Zeus cast far from Othrys. This stone landed at a place called Pytho. On the slopes of Mount Parnassus, lodged fast in the earth where it would, in time, become the Amphalos, or the navel stone of Greece, the Hellenic belly button, its spiritual center and point of origin, and from exactly the spot where it fell, by the command of Gaia, for whom this place was already most sacred, there had emerged out of the ground a huge dragon serpent to serve as the stone's guardian. The dragon serpent took the name of its birthplace and was called Python, as have many snakes in his honor been named since. Hera, in her anger toward Zeus for fathering Artemis and Apollo by the titanus Leto, a goddess in her own right of motherhood and a recognized paragon of modesty, sent Python to kill Leto and her children Artemis and Apollo. Zeus whispered the news of Hera's intention to the wind, and the wind whispered it to the infant Apollo, who in turn sent another message to Hephaestus, begging for the best bow and arrow his half-brother could fashion, and for seven days and seven nights Hephaestus worked his mighty forge and produced a matchlessly beautiful and powerful weapon and a set of golden arrows, which were dispatched to Delos for Apollo. The moment Python emerged from the sea and slithered onto the sand, Apollo stepped from his concealment and shot him through the eye with an arrow, where he sliced the dead body into pieces there on the beach and sent up a great cry of triumph to the sky. Unfortunately for Apollo, even though you may think him justified in protecting himself, his sister, and his mother, Python was chthonic. He sprang from the earth making him a child of Gaia and under divine protection. Zeus knew that he must punish Apollo for slaying the serpent or lose all authority. Although the chosen punishment was not so very harsh, 
The young god Apollo was exiled for eight years to Python's birthplace beneath Mount Parnassus to atone for his crime, where he not only replaced the snake monster Python as guardian of the Amphalos, but was tasked with organizing a regular tournament there. And so, the Pythian Games were held every four years, two on either side of the Olympic meeting. Apollo changed the name of Pytho to Delphi, where he established an oracle for anyone to come and ask the god or his appointed priestess, sometimes known as Sibyl or the Pythia, questions about the future. Here, in a trance-like state of prophetic ecstasy, the priestess sits out of sight above a chasm in the ground which channels down to the womb of the earth itself then calls her ambiguous prognostications up into the chamber above, where the anxious petitioner awaits her proclamation. In this way, Apollo and the Pythia are seen to draw their oracular powers from Gaia herself, Apollo's great-grandmother. Vapors are said to rise from beneath the ground that many take to be Gaia's actual breath. And the spring of Castalia bubbles up here whose waters are said to inspire poetry in those who drink them or hear their whispers. Apollo never lies, nor does he ever give a straight answer, finding it amusing to reply with another question, or a riddle so obscure only to make sense when it is too late to act upon it. To atone for his grievous assault on the proper way of things, and to allow the slain python to sleep the eternal sleep of death in the arms of his mother Gaia. Zeus finally fixed the serpent's resting place, the island of Delos, to the earth. While it no longer floats free, those who visit the island can testify to this day that it is tough to sail to. Beset by violent Etesian winds, and treacherous Maltemi currents, with anyone traveling there likely to suffer the most awful seasickness. One might say, it is as if Hera has still not forgiven Delos for the part it played in the birth of the glorious twins Artemis and Apollo.